People I call retrogrades. How to re-evangelize the de-Christianized West. Support us in any way you can, most especially by your prayers. From an authentically Catholic perspective. Right-minded, righteous group that's equal in strength to the radicals. From an authentically masculine perspective. You and your friends versus me and my friends. Bring it on. Welcome to Rules for Retrogrades. Happy feast day of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Today, Dave and I are joined by two very special guests. This is uh, Joseph Gonzalez and his wife, Monique. Joseph is an award-winning music composer who has written the scores for a multitude of film and TV movies, uh, documentaries, and episodics. Many have won or been nominated for stellar awards such as the Oscar, the Emmy, the Peabody, his symphonic Oratorio, uh, Misa Azteca, relevant in some ways to today, has been performed at Carnegie Hall, the Sydney Opera House, and the Walt Disney Concert Hall. It is by researching into Aztec poetry from Misa Azteca that Gonzalez stumbled onto the premise for the prophetical case for Guadalupe, which we're going to be talking about today. Monique Gonzalez, uh, has been studying classical voice since the age of 19 with various vocal instructors. She's been a professional cantor at several prominent churches in Los Angeles, New York City, Ann Arbor, Michigan. In 2009, she moved back to LA and is music editor and score production coordinator for Simple Music Productions, overseeing the production of internationally recorded full orchestral scores. Wow. She recently worked on Children of Giant, which won the 2015 Imagine Award and sang on the score of Latino Americans, which won the 2014 Peabody Award. We're honored, Dave and I, to be joined by you guys on Rules for Retrogrades today on the feast day of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Welcome to Rules for Retrogrades. Thanks for being with us, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. us. Really happy to be here. So Guys. really, really quickly, this is the first time Dave's hearing it. I was going to I was going to get his response here. What's the jaw dropping premise for rules for retrogrades listeners out there and viewers is that uh, Dave, you're hearing it for the first time. It's at a book of Aztec poetry where you're getting essentially it, it's aping, mimicking or I guess prefiguring the the story of Juan Diego going up the, the hill. Uh, right. And I mean, this is a jaw dropping. Mm-hmm. Premise. So yeah, I because you've told you've laid this all out for me over the course of like two meals. Um, yeah, what, sorry to cut in there, Dave. What were you gonna say? Yeah, I was just gonna say for our listeners, and it, you know, not everybody may be familiar with with the story of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Could you give just a very bare bones run through so everybody knows exactly what we're talking about and what we're comparing it to, if you don't mind? Okay, in um, in 1531. Now this is. 10 years after the fall of Mexico, which would have been in 1521. In 1531, in December, a man named Juan Diego passing by a hill where he heard these flowers, uh, excuse me, he heard these uh, birds singing. He actually says, um, I'm, I'm in this place where, where the, the, the songs are being echoed by the rocks and I'm seeing these incandescent stones and I'm seeing this other place. Um, this goes into our premise a little bit, but the word he uses in the word in Nahuatl, that's the language, would have been the language of the Mesoamerican people during the time of the conquest. He uses a term called Xochitlalpan Tonacatlalpan, which essentially means the flower world paradise. So he, he suddenly finds himself into this place and he says, what am I hearing? Um, do Am I worthy of what I hear? Could this be the place that our ancestors spoke of? Okay. Now, essentially, then, he meets Our Lady of Guadalupe. And Guadalupe, um, that she wants Apple to be built, this hill called Tepeyac. Now, try to remember the word Tep, because it, it, comes, it comes in a lot um, in, in our different explanations of things. But it essentially means a hill, a hill or a small mountain, Tep. So Tepeyac is a small hill. So he passes by, 
He meets the Virgin Mary. She says, I want this chapel to be uh, built on this hill and puts him through kind of a series of um, tests where he has to go ask the bishop. He gets ridiculed by his own people. He goes back and forth. And finally, it comes down to the bishop asking for a miracle. And and um, depending on the account you read, there's essentially four different accounts that come from the 1600s. Some of them say a multitude of flowers, but uh, many of them use the, um, a made-up word called caste yan shochit, which essentially is was a made-up word for rose. He asked for a rose, roses. Juan Diego goes, um, it's also the fact that he is worried about his uncle because he's dying. So he, he takes this uh, interesting way around the hill. He actually approaches the hill from a different angle, a different going from, uh, what is it, west to east. Which to is avoid the hill, part, right? To he's avoid trying to the avoid hill. the hill so yeah. he won't see uh, Mary. He right. won't be embarrassed or whatnot. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. here's the thing. Even that plays into our theory, and, and hopefully we can get to that. But essentially, um, she says, you know, look at your your uncle's going to be OK. And this is really where the, the famous line comes where she says, you know, am I not your mother? You know, won't I take care of you? You know, do, do I not caress you? Do I not um, essentially uh, take care? Yeah hold you in my arms. Now, what happens after that, she leads him up to the hill. She leads him up to the hill, and he brings those flowers down to the bishop as proof that he actually did meet with the Virgin Mary. And and um, and on his tilma, which was made of a maguey fiber, which is actually pretty um, corrosive and would not last as long as it, it, as it does, um, he is able to... Um, convince the bishop to the building of a chapel, which which does happen. Actually, there's a series of chapels that come after that. So that's essentially the Juan Diego story. When we get into our explanation, we're going to talk about key aspects of that story and why it relates to what we're calling, well, not we're calling, but scholars have called Flower World. So between ask, all of this happens between December 9th and December 11th, correct? Uh, all of the interactions with the bishop. Well, yeah. That, okay. That's where we get the that's image. Cool. Got it. So hopefully that was a good thumbnail of the uh, of the story of Juan Diego. And after that, essentially, um, within the first ten years from 1531, in the in the preceding decade, we get approximate nine million Christian conversions. Now we do know that this happened because there were letters that were going back and forth primarily within the Franciscan order um, uh, because um, there were so many baptisms that were happening that they, they, had, they lined them up in rows of hundreds and basically put uh, sprinkled uh, water on them. So there were actually letters that went to the Vatican. And finally, in 1537, a papal bull came from the Vatican, which basically, it was called Altitudo, uh, Altitudo, to the Divino Concilii, um, which essentially is was saying, uh, okay, it's it's okay what you've done so far, but you have to follow the rubrics a little bit better on a, on, on a baptism. But the the important part of this is that it's a documentation that this did actually occur in the in the 1530s. Right. Got it. So what you're adding that's new to the the common um, story, the common narrative of Guadalupe is that there is a, um, a kind of enculturation that might have been hundreds of over a thousand years uh, in, yeah. in the baking, right, in uh, Aztec culture in the Americas that runs right alongside the imagery, the iconography, the phantasmagoria uh, that would be shared with Juan Diego on the hill. And people, this has always been kept separate is this, uh, Monique, is this what the, the Guadalupe scholars have always held, that, that this has the, the secular iteration of this in the secular historians of Mesoamerica? They say this has nothing to do with Guadalupe. Yeah, for the most part, the secular scholars just like to focus on the tilma. And if they could attack the tilma and, um, you know, discredit it in any way, and as well as ignoring the uh, records of all the conversions, then there's nothing to see here, so to speak, right? So kind of what we enjoy about what we're just what we're going to be presenting to you is that this goes around that this is working in tandem with the Toma, 
but it's also independent of it. So they, what we call a network of ideas, this is a term we use a lot in our talks, is, you know, Guadalupe is a network of different ideas that came together at a perfect time and a perfect place. And they work in tandem with one another. And Joseph could probably run off with that as well. But it's basically this idea that the secular scholars just want to tell everybody, oh, well, you're, you're not being very intelligent if you, if you believe in the Toma because we can discredit it, even though there is more scientific evidence proving for the Toma. But yeah, right. that's pretty much what the nutshell is. And how does this play into uh, kind of the teleology of this Marian apparition, you know, the purpose of it? Uh, what, why was it so important, you know, that Providence deigned to have Mary appear to, to Juan Diego at this time? Um, what's going on? What's the backstory? What was her end in appearing? Well, I think especially nowadays with the whole Pachamama thing that's been going on lately right. and a lot of concerns about idolatry. Um, our, our Lady Guadalupe has been brought up quite a bit, you know, so as far as relevance is concerned, I think she's just a wonderful answer for how to deal with what's occurring in the church right now. It's how to deal with like, something specific. As far as like a larger picture, I think that's part of what the theory is about is one of the first questions we asked when we saw that first poem was how old is this? Poem? Also to answer your question, Dave, is that, you know, it, um, if, uh, you know, uh, if we if we can convince you or if we can convince your audience of this theory, perhaps showing that there was a salvific plan for the Americas, okay, that was thousands of years in the making, essentially, um, that um, people don't talk about um, or people don't know about. Because it, it's really, it's hard to explain. It's very obscure. It's very specialized. And um, it took us a long time to get to this point and um once we get into it i you know I, I i could see you know how everybody would doubt it and and say um uh you know th th could th could this be true but um that's why a lot of times when we give this talk we have to give so much backstory mm -hmm. in order to to prove the point but um let's see how we do you know the, and the reason i ask is just because in this network of ideas i feel like this would be the you know, the end of these apparitions and this kind of um, extraordinary revelation of the Christian God to the indigenous peoples of the Americas, that's really, is that not partly at the heart of, of where you're going with this network of ideas, taking people away from the false gods and, you know, providence revealing um, God and Our Lady to to the ind indigenous people to get them away from worship of you know Tanansin and the these false pagan gods. Right, absolutely. You know when um, when we when we're going to go through some of these historical documents, you know um, the Franciscans who first showed up to try to evangelize the indigenous. Um, the indigenous, of course, were very, very skeptical. Um, uh, in fact, it was a lot of belief that that the evangelical efforts had failed within the first 10 years. There's letters from Zumarraga saying that, you know, the, the people are very cold. There were stumbling blocks to that. One of them was the was the issue of polygamy, and because a lot of the natives were not uh, willing to give up pol polygamy. But essentially, after that, after Our Lady Guadalupe appeared and this whole shift occurred, they wanted to become baptized. They wanted to accept the Christian God, and um, there was there was a there was a fervor. There was I mean there was uh, people were crying. People were traveling for so many miles. So there was a huge shift, and you know it, it gets really confused because you know this word syncretism comes up a lot, and um, you know I went to a conference, a Mesoamerican conference, a couple of months ago, and there was one of the experts in this field about the Christianization of the Americas. And one of the points that he made, his name is Oscar Matzin. And the point that he made is he said, you know, the Franciscan friars, when they came, they were not here to create a third religion. They were against that. That was their whole mission was to was to wipe out, you know, uh, paganism, to wipe out these practices and to bring the, the people over to, Christ, uh, to Christianity. So it was it was a complete conversion that happened. Of course, it was not it wasn't always a, a, a clean road. It, it was actually a very bumpy road. Um, after the apparition of Guadalupe in 1531, it's not as if everything became perfect. There was still mixtures of idolatry that, that occurred. 
But that was not the position of the friars. That was not the position of the Catholic Church to actually create syncretism in order to somehow uh, fool the indigenous into converting it to Christianity. Nice. So can you give us, um, you, like, I know you give this in presentation form, give us the skeletal uh, structure of, because uh, I, I, you've, you've, you've all but convinced me I, I'd really like to present this thing in the most uh, deliverable form to the Rules for Retrograde audience out there. I think it's incredibly important uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more, uh, North America is key to the salvation of the world. It plays an important providential role. That's what I write about in Catholic Republic. What I was immediately attracted to about your guys' theory is that it's, it's South America, uh, you know, it's Mesoamerica and, uh, I, I it makes a really, really important, it, it stakes an important claim for the new world writ large. So, yeah, I'd, I'd love to get the, the skeletal structure of the theory out there. Okay, um, we'll, give, we'll give the structure, um, but I, I think at some point we should actually read the poem to you. Yeah. Because what's in the poem is really important. Um, why, don't, why don't we go ahead and do that first? Uh, the, Good. The, this, is, this song is, is called Uica del Cayo, Origin of the Songs also translated into the beginning of songs. It's the first song of a collection of so-called Aztec poems, about 90 or so. There's about 180 known Aztec songs that were collected before the conquest and after the conquest. 90 of them are in this one collection of Cantares Mexicanos. And the, the one that Monique is gonna read for you is the very first song. So go ahead and read it, Monique. I am wondering where I might gather some pretty sweet flowers. Whom shall I ask? Suppose that I ask the brilliant hummingbird, the emerald trembler. Suppose that I ask the yellow butterfly. They will tell me, they know, where bloom the pretty sweet flowers, where, where I may gather them here in the laurel woods, where dwell the Sitnitskan birds, or whether I may gather them in the flowery forest where the Tlaquecho lives. There they may be plucked, sparkling with dew. There they come forth in perfection, Perhaps I shall find they showed them to me. I gather a cloakful, and with these I greet the, greet the princess. With these I entertain the lords. So truly, as I walk along, I hear the rocks, the mountains, as it were, replying, echoing to the sweet songs of the flowers. Truly, the glittering, chattering water answers the bird green fountain. There it sings. It dashes forth. It sings again. The mockingbird answers. Perhaps the coyote bird answers. And many sweet singing birds scatter their songs around like music. They bless the earth, pouring out their sweet voices. And I said, I cried aloud, may I not cause you pain, you beloved ones, who are seated to listen. May the brilliant hummingbirds come soon. Whom do we seek, O noble poet? I ask, I say, where are the pretty fragrant flowers with which I may make glad you, my noble compeers? Soon they will sing to me, here we will make you to see, thou singer, truly wherewith thou shalt make glad the nobles, thy companions. And they led me within a valley to a fertile spot, a flowery spot, where the dew spread out in glittering splendor, where I saw various lovely fragrant flowers, lovely odorous flowers, clothed with the dew, scattered around in rainbow glory. And there they said to me, pluck the flowers, for be glad, and give them to your friends, to the nobles, that they may rejoice on the earth. So I gathered in the folds of my garment the various fragrant flowers, delicate scented, delicious. And I said, may some of our people enter here. May very many of us be here. And I thought I should go forth to announce to our friends that here all of us should rejoice in the different lovely odorous flowers and that we should call the various sweet songs with which we might rejoice our friends here on earth and the nobles in their grandeur and dignity. So I, the singer, gathered all the flowers to place them upon the nobles, to clothe them and put them in their hands. And soon I lifted my voice in a worthy song glorifying the nobles for the voice, the face of the call in Tloque and Nawake, where there is no servitude. But where will he whose worth is nothing who is wretched and who sins on get delicious flowers. 
where would he find them? Could he whose worth is nothing, who is wretched and whose sins on earth, accompany me to flower land, the land of plenty, in Shoshit Lalban and Donakat Lalban? If one purchases it, it here on earth, it is only through submission to the cause of all fills my soul, as I recall where I the singer saw the flowery spot, Shoshit Lalban. And I said, truly, there is no good spot here on earth. Truly, in some other born, there is gladness. For what good is this earth? Truly, there is another life in the hereafter. There may I go. There the sweet birds sing. There may I learn to know those good which alone, pleasurably, sweetly intoxicate, which alone, pleasurably, sweetly intoxicate. All right. Thank you, Monique. OK, so um, I know you probably have a lot of questions, but this might be a good time to to give you what I believe or what we believe um, is the meaning of this. It's essentially a story of a singer who is going about trying to find sweet flowers and is asking the hummingbird, asking certain specific birds, it's Ininskan birds, where are the flowers? The, then um, the singer then believes that that he is actually going to find the flowers because the hummingbirds agree to take him to the flowers, to flower land, so he can gather the flowers. So they go into a valley, okay? Um, and actually, some people say that this might even mean inside a mountain because the word is tepiak, Um, But essentially, um, the um, he leads them into this fertile land and He's the they the hummingbirds bring him to the flower to the multitude of precious flowers, and the and the singer then gathers the flowers and then brings them to his friends on earth. But what is really funny is that the way that the poem ends, if you get around verse seven or so, the whole mood of the of the poem changes because the singer then says, "Wait a minute, I can't go to the flowers. I'm a sinner. I am not worthy to go see." Flower land, and that's why we kept Monique kept saying it in the Nahuatl term, which is Shochitlalpantonakatlalpon. I am not worthy to go to flower world. I got a glimpse of flower world, but it saddens me because I'm not worthy in order to go there. Perhaps I will see flower land in the next life in eternity, but I probably won't. And there's a little bit of backstory you have to give because the the belief back then was basically either you were a warrior or a woman who died in childbirth, already of the people who would never actually go on to eternity. So it ends It ends as a lament, okay? Now, um, when we, part of uh, the basis of our thesis is really comparing this poem to the first account in Nahuatl, which is uh, of the apparitions of Guadalupe called the Nican Moboa. And, um, just to give you kind of a little bit of a spoiler alert so that we don't seem like we're too off the wall right here. When you read the very beginning and kind of the, 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 the basis of our thesis is that this flower song that, that, we, that we just read to you, the uh, origin of the songs and the account of Guadalupe kind of read as first chapter, second chapter. Hmm. This, because when, when the story starts with Juan Diego on the very first part of it, and he said he heard singing from a small hill, like the song of many fine birds. I mean, this is almost mm -hmm. a direct quote from the other poem, okay? When their voices cease, as, as, it was as if the hill answered the songs even more gentle. Do you remember in the other poem where it said he went into a valley and the rocks were singing to the mountains and the rivers were responding? I mean, it's word for word, okay? Uh, more joyful than those of the Coyotot and the Tsininskan birds, the exact birds that were mentioned in the previous poem, okay? And of other delicate sung birds. Now listen to this. Juan stopped around. He said <coughs> to himself, am I worthy of what I hear? Perhaps I'm only dreaming it. Now think about that. Why would he say, am I worthy of what I'm here, of what I hear? If you're going to come to a beautiful place of, of singing birds and iridescent rocks and, and song and music all around you, why would you say, am I worthy of what I'm hearing? He knew where he was. Now let's go back to the origin of the songs. The first thing, 
How does the song end? It ends by the singer saying, I am not worthy to be here. So that's one, that's I think the first, uh, another clue that Juan Diego was referencing these songs. Now let's keep going. He Wait, said, can I, can I this, break in yeah. real fast, Joseph? Yes. Before you, you go there, I asked you this question the first time I met you uh, over a year ago. What of the cynics out there that will say, um, so he, so Juan Diego might be playing on uh, tendentiously the kind of pre-existent mythology or whatever of the region. I mean, right. yeah, just because that's going to pop into people's heads right away. And you, uh, you have a good answer. Oh, yeah. Go on with your uh, explication. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, OK, let's get to that right now, then. Scholars basically believe that there's four people that could have possibly made up the Guadalupe story. It comes down to four individuals. The first one would be an indigenous scholar named Antonio Valeriano. Now, he was born in 1520, okay? Uh, the second person would have been Bernardino de Sagún, Friar Bernardino de Sagún. Now, he was an expert in the Nahuatl language. He's the author of the Florentine Codex. Basically, all that we know about Mesoamerica comes from this gigantic book. It's, it's, it's actually 12 books together um, that we know everything about um, the, the, the Nawaz, uh, what was going on, uh, medicinal uh, uh, herbs, um, the history of the conquest. They lived in the 1500s. The next one would have been Miguel Sanchez, who actually did the first publication of the story of Guadalupe in Spanish in 1648. The next one would be Luis Lasso de la Vega from 1649. Scholars in general say if, you know, the, it's possibly these four guys that made up this story because simply you had to really know Nawa culture in order to come up with this idea. So let's go, since, since you brought it up, let's go one by one. Bernardino de Sagún is on record of being 100% against Guadalupe. Um, he was said that, you know, the, the, the Guadalupe was a demonic invention. Um, right. You have to understand these are the times of, you know, the Spanish Inquisition, the Mexican Inquisition. And it is very clear that, it, it, you know, scholars it. say, no, we got it. We got to knock Bernardino out. Now, um, somebody actually did write a paper with Antonio Valeriano, the guy who was born in 1520. They, th because the story gets really complicated and, and I, I have to, there's so many aspects to it, but I'll try to get to the chase. <laughs> Essentially, the 1649 publication by Luis Lasso de la Vega in the Nahuatl language, many people believe that it was copied from an earlier version, which could have been either in 1548 or 1556, that, that magic year that, that we were just talking about a little bit. Okay. In fact, um, you know, uh, there's, there's only really one paper that we've read that really goes into depth with that. That's a, a scholar named uh, Arnold Farias. Antonio Adriano was a social agent, that he was part of the colonial project, and that's why he made up this uh, story. Now, here is the major problem with this, and this is why the reason, why knowing that the devotion of Guadalupe happened in 1531, Valeriano would have been 11 years old, okay? And what we know about Valeriano is that he didn't enter the, um, it was is the first uni university of the Americas. It was called the Colegio de Santa Cruz or the Holy Cross College in, in Tlatelolco. Um, he entered it when he was 13. Now he did become a scholar in Nahuatl, Latin, Spanish, and Greek. I mean, he was, he was really, really an uh, amazing indigenous student. And that's why a lot of pe people say, well, it had to be Valeriano who made this up because he was the smartest, he was the star. But the problem is, is that chronologically, it doesn't work out. The other two people that were in the 16, uh, 1648 and 1649, Miguel Sanchez and Luis, Las, Luis Lazo de la Vega, well, that only works if there was no devotion in the 1500s. And that's what a lot of these um, scholars claim, right. that there was this, somehow there was this hundred years of so silence and there was no mention of Guadalupe in the 1500s. Well, that is just... That idea just really has to go away because there is so much information that shows that there was an early on devotional. I mean, we can cite 
so many different references, analyses, um, different things that actually mention uh, Guadalupe. So, um, so really, that's part of our thesis here is that it simply doesn't work out. Now, people have said that possibly, well, then why didn't Juan Diego make it up? But that is so unlikely. He would have had to be the greatest talkster around. Um, there's too many things that, um, you know, references, you know, people talk about kind of European references mixed in with indigenous uh, references, but um, no scholar we, we know of has, has ever thought that Juan Diego would have made the story up. Okay, right. And one thing to note also is that part of the skeptic line for many years was Juan Diego might not have been a real person, but that went by the wayside when they went through in, in the canonization process of Juan Diego through the mm -hmm. parish registry and they actually found Juan Diego in the parish registry, right? I, I believe he had a some kind of a position in the church too. Um, not, not a ministerial position, but I, like a, a volunteerism position. Well, he was the caretaker of the first chapel that was built in 1531. Okay. Oh, okay. yeah. That's nice. Yeah. Right. That before. Right. There, there, there was there was an inquest that happened in 1666 where they brought a lot of uh, witnesses, and uh, a lot of these people had it were either like uh, you know two, uh, one or two people away from uh, Juan Diego who died in 1548. So um, uh, that that uh, that issue was really dealt with in the, in the 1666 inquest as to the validity of there actually being a Juan Diego, where he came from. He came from a town called Guatitlan, um, and uh, people who knew that he was the caretaker of this place, and there was plenty of eyewitnesses to that. Excellent. He was not Mexica, like a lot of people think. You know, Mexica as in the people from Mexico City. He was from a different tribe, the Texcocan. And Joseph can explain a little more of the significance of what of what that is, but the when you think about human sacrifice and uh, um, and, and the Mashika, he was not a part of that line. Yeah, let me let me just try to explain it right now. Um, you know, a lot of people kind of thinks it's uh, everybody was Aztec. Um, first of all, <laughs> the term Aztec actually didn't come up until the 1800s. Um, the people during that time they never uh, they never would have called themselves Aztec. They called themselves the Mashika. Now, the Mexica were one of many different city nations. Yes, they were the dominant ones, but there was close to 51 or 53 different city nations in the Valley of Mexico during the time of the conquest. Earlier in that century, early in the century before, there was so much warring that was going on that there was a triple alliance that was formed um, between the Mexica, or the people from Tenochtitlan, uh, Tacuba, and the people from Texcoco. Now, Texcoco was really the second in line of, uh, of dominance in, in this area. Their ruler of Texcoco was a guy named Nezahuacoyot, or Hungry Wolf. That's why a lot of people uh, uh, translate his name. And he's actually known as, as the Poet King. He used to write these flower songs. In fact, we have several of his flower songs. This, this idea of flower song and flower world plays so dominant in this... Um, the talk about Guadalupe, because just to give you an example, the way in which the gods are references, um, you know, the, the, the terms that are used, uh, you know, the, 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 the mythological gods are gods like the war god, Huitzilipochtli, or the god of water, Tlaloc. But those gods are not part of this flowerland poetry. In ter instead, they use terms like Intlokenawake, which means the god of far and near, and you find those in the pow in the flower songs. And the reason why this is so important is because when Guadalupe identifies herself, mm -hmm. when she says, I am the mother, she uses the term, I am the mother of Entloque Nahuake, the god of far and near. I am the mother of Ipanemwani, the, the creator of, of the earth, of, of everything. And, and uh, once we get back to this flower thing, I we believe that she was distinguishing herself, that she was coming from this flower world line, not from the uh, the, the mythological lines. Or these, so for clarity's these sake, uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe uses the expression, I am the mother of the god of far and near, the same expression used in the uh, flower poetry? Yes. Yes. Yes, she does. Wow. Yeah, she uses right. those terms. 
usually, as we said before, it takes us about two hours to give this explanation. Um, we're in the process of writing a book right now, um, and we hope that it'll be done by spring or, or hopefully the summer. But um, it, it's a lot to, to take in. But uh, if I may, if I can just continue on with these kind of similarities with the Guadalupe Spall story. By all means, yeah. Okay, so as I was reading before, um, he, you know, he says, am I worthy of what I hear? Now, this is really the line. This is verse 10. He says, where am I? Do I find myself? Could this be the place that the old ones, our ancestors, spoke about? The land of flower, the flowery world paradise. Could this be the heavenly land? Now, here's the thing. What could he be talking about? He's saying, could this be the place that our ancestors spoke it? Could this be the place? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. He's, he's, he's obviously making a reference in the story to some pre-existing knowledge, something that his ancestors knew of. And he specifically uses the term in Nahuatl, Xochitlalpan. Xochitl is the word for flower. Xochitl. Xochitlalpan, Tonacatlalpan. Tonacatlalpan really means kind of a place of sustenance or energy. He actually makes a specific reference to the flower world, which is the same reference that you see in the earlier poem. Now, if uh, there's a lot of other references between these two documents, but um, if I may, I just kind of would like to move on just a little bit uh, uh, further with, with this concept. Essentially, what's happening is um, how, how, where did these, po where does this origin of the song come from? Um, you know, who made it up? You know, you know, what is the importance of this? And how old is it? Now, if you go into the people like John Beerhost, he's the earlier guy who wrote, uh, who did the translation that Monique read. He gives a theory. Um, it, it has to do with this thing called Spanish loan words, and it gets really complicated. But he believes that they're all post-conquest. Other scholars say, well, perhaps these poems are a generation two or three before um, the conquest. So, okay, so they're moving back a little bit further. But what's very interesting, um, we have a third collaborator, and his name is Dr. Ezekiel, Dr. Ezekiel Steer. He has his PhD in Spanish colonial literature. He really helped us bust this whole question wide open. What he did is that um, we were doing research together with him, and we didn't really find the answer in anthropology and early Spanish colonial literature. The answer was really found in ling linguistics, okay? Now, just hmm. try to follow me along with this. There was a linguist named Jane Hill. Uh, she published a paper, and she, and she, and she called it... Um, it had to do with the Udo Aztecan language family. And she took this song. In fact, maybe Monique could explain it better. She took this song and said, look it, if we take this concept of a flower world, we see flower world all around Mesoamerica. And it's very, very old. In fact, this idea, she actually coined it the flower world complex, is actually predominant in Mesoamerica. So, Monique, why don't you explain it a little bit more? So just to give a little bit of the significance of the flower world complex, what makes it unique is that it doesn't just belong to Mesoamerica, it also belongs to North America. So it's basically shared by a, a language family called the Udo Azteca language family, and just to kind of give some context, like, you know, like Italian and Spanish are part of the same language family. Well, Nahuatl is part of a larger language family that extends all the way up to the top of Oregon and Idaho and Wyoming and swoops all the way down Western United States through Mexico and into Guatemala. So basically this entire region not only shared language roots, but also spiritual beliefs that were passed um, from north to south quite frequently. And so in her examination of the different poetry and the songs of each of these different cultures, that when, that's when she noticed that they were specifically sharing this flower world complex, which has a lot of many, it has uh, multiple characteristics, some of which have to do with um, the flowering land paradise what it looks like, it's full of birds and hummingbirds and iridescent, um, incandescent rock stones and shells, and they, and they all are involved with this flower mountain of which everything, all life emanates and goes back to. So um, she speculated that 
for it to be that widespread, that it has to have very deep ancient origins. So she placed it much further back in time to a couple thousand years. And then what happened after that point, once she coined that term, a lot of other scholars jumped on board to kind of see, if, to test her theory. And that's when we have archaeologists jumping in to see if they could find those characteristics. There's a, a large set of those characteristics, about 10 or 12 of them. They started checking to see if that existed in, in carvings and, and ruins. And they discovered um, specifically one scholar by the name of Carl Taub, who's kind of considered the expert in this field, um, started discovering... Um, the rock shards and carvings and um, archaeological digs that could be hard dated that had all of these same characteristics. E either they had all of them or they had many of them. Um, and when he was dating it, he was dating it back to about five, 6,000 years. So that's how we're able to kind of put a date on that. So the understanding is that that first poem that you heard uh, me read is that it has origins in the ancient annals of time. And all scholars at this point do believe that, which is kind of interesting when you think about it. So you'll see the Hopi, you'll see the Shoshone, you'll see um, some parts of the Comanche, different Hohokam, the Maya. There's an 80-foot wall in Chichen Itza that when we interviewed this scholar, uh, Dr. Carl Taub, who's the archaeologist, he said it's um, 80 yards long and it's basically flower wool. Wow. So the in wow. indications are that this uh, prefigures the life of Christ. Uh, the the iconography quite possibly so that's where joseph and i um you know on the team we're kind of looking at it like it, it is similar to how the hebrews were prepared and prophetical means for jesus coming the people on this side of the atlantic were given a similar um type of uh preparation right and you know you you hear and there's some scholarship and scholarly opinions among the orthodox um among Orthodox Catholics out there that will say, you know, even after uh, the fall of man and the kind of fall into error concerning religion and into error concerning theology from the very origins of the race, you know, we didn't lose all of our revelation of God. We didn't lose all of that, that natural, um, well, that original supernatural revelation of God. So maybe there's this thread that has continued unblemished, even though there's been an admixture of some errors. There's always been some degree of truth out there that that about God, about the afterlife. Right. This this might be a good time to to really introduce one of our heroes here, Miguel Leon Portilla, and this book, which came out in 1956. Portilla addresses your your paper, uh, your, what you just said right now. He makes a distinction between what he calls the high priest and the tlamatini, which are the wise men. Okay, everything that we know about um, the flower world, the flower uh, poems. Um, is down the Tlamatini or the wise men. He makes a clear distinction between the high priest, which are actually the people of Mesoamerica that are mainly associated with the people of the Mexica or the Aztecs. Because, you know, we, we kind of get this, this idea that, you know, it was, it was human sacrifice all the time in Mesoamerica. Um, yeah, it, 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 it was around, but it wasn't, it really didn't kick in until the mid 1400s. And a lot of it can be attributed to one gentleman who was kind of like a Rasputin character named Tlacalal. And if you want to talk about him, Monique. So Tlacalal, just to give some context, well, I think guys. a lot of people, when they hear about, uh, you know, the human sacrifices, they assume it's been going on for hundreds of years, right? But what we discovered was there was, in the 1450s, like what they call an era of devastation, devastating disasters. There's a lot of famine um, a lot of hungry people. It was just a horrible time. And so uh, Tlacalel, who was the half-brother of Moctezuma I, who was the ruler of Mexico in the early 1400s, put forth the idea like, ah, maybe we can get our props back and not have so many people dying of hunger if we sacrifice people. So he made a proposition to set up a temple to their main god, whose name was Huichli Pochli, and I'm sure a lot of people have maybe heard this, this name before, basically saying, with blood, we can bring back the crops. With blood, we can save our people. And so from the onset of 1459 to about 1486, 
there was this massive uptick in human sacrifice and they pretty much were going into the neighboring areas and using it kind of as a, ter a terroristic plot to kind of in part keep people under control but also to feed this god so that they can continue surviving and there's a whole bunch more about that but the basic idea is that it was a, a rel relatively new invention so to speak that human sacrifice like all cultures it existed in, in small parts, but never to the degree that it became so from the mid 1400s to when the Spaniards came. So Monique, uh, one, one often hears, I think I first heard it from Dr. Peter Craved, this num uh, ratio thrown around of one in four children were sacrificed to the Aztec gods. Is this, does this hold for this time period specifically, or do you guys accept that, dispute that? I've always heard it. Um, that's a possibility. I'm not always good at being able to convert the ratios. But I know that when they erected the, the temple for the very first time, there is a recording of about 80,000 people being sacrificed within a few days. Okay. So that, that was in 1483, that number comes up. So it holds that there was lots of human sacrifice and going on. Not like you, you guys are yeah. you're, you're square with that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. The, recent, the recent scholarship because they've been digging around the Temple Mayor, which is where that main, in Mexico City where the main temple was. And initially, scholars were poo pooing the whole idea, saying, "Ah, oh, it wasn't that many." But now they're finding skull, all these skull racks that are right. that are giving a lot more credence to those numbers. Yeah. Usually you don't have skull racks without a lot of human skulls around, I'd imagine. Right. Yeah. If you've ever used the word skull rack in your, uh, in your craft, uh, you're killing a lot of people. <laughs> Normal non-mass so. murderers, they don't have skull racks. Like, you Not got even the spice thing. rack over here, you got your cow, here's the skull rack. Uh, yeah. Empty yeah, yeah, most yeah. of the year. <laughs> yeah. We don't have skull racks, so we're <laughs> cool on that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> so, so needless to say, that Iraq idea is in direct opposition to what we're saying. And so that book that Just was holding up was kind of um, describing the difference in those two lines of thought. And that the, the human sacrifice was very specifically held by the Mexica with one of 53, 54 different tribes in that particular valley. And so um, as a result, it was very easy for everybody else to kind of turn on them. So when the Spaniards came in, they're all like, hey, you got to help us out. We've been terrorized by this one tribe. Let's see what we can do to kick it to, for you guys to take them out. And that is what happened in a very short period of time because everybody was against the Mexica. Right. The, the Spanish were appalled. You know, they thought it was diabolical sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, so can you tie up I, some of the loose ends here? Just, I think this is compelling stuff. I just, I just want to get it out there in main form. I know your book's coming out. What's your book going to be called, by the way? Uh, we're not sure. We might call it uh, Guadalupe yeah, and the title. Flower World. I think we're working on that title right now. Once you start doing interviews, this is a little word to the wise. And you start saying, oh, it's this book. And then people, you know, you got thousands of people out there saying, I, I want to get this book. You're like, I guess this is the title because you throw a bunch of people off. So, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll be looking forward to it. Yeah, I'd like you to tie it all together um, so that it's a kind of cohesive whole. Uh, so this sticks out in people's minds the way it stuck out in my mind the last year since you told me about all this okay i'll try to do it as quickly as possible um getting back to this book why why is this where is this pre preoccupation with flowers and flowers coming down from this hill he basically says that the flowers are a metaphor for truth um he 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 gets kind of into the aesthetics that beauty equals truth and we talk about that a lot in our in our lectures but um so essentially if you go back to the poem of what the singer was looking for the singer was looking for the truth so they the, the singer wants to gather that that truth in his cloak and to bring it back down to earth and what we part of our theory is this is that when Juan Diego, um, the, the, the pinnacle point, the, the thing that actually brought the Nahua people to want to accept the Christian God was the fact that he gathered the flowers. He gathered the truth from the top of the hill and he brought it down. A story that they had been hearing their whole lives for possibly hundreds, thousands of years. And the implication of that 
we believe to the Nahua people would mean that the commoner, which were a majority of the people, that eternity was now available to them. In the old system it wasn't, but in the new system it was. And that is actually indicated and and shown metaphorically by the fact that Juan Diego actually gathered the flowers, something that the singer had been wanting to do for thousands of years. So Juan Diego completes this story. And there's a, there's another theory that we're working on. There's a there's a um, a professor named James Lockhart, and he has this theory called double mistaken identity. And an event will occur, and the two cultures will interpret an event in completely two different ways, and the two cultures won't even know that the other cultures, that there's a discrepancy between what the meaning of it is, and neither do they care uh, if there's a different meaning. We believe that something like that happened. Now, you know, this may sound a little scandalous right now, but but just something to think about, okay? You know, we used to live in Pasadena, and, and you know, of course, you have the Rose Parade in, in January. So, you know, to say that roses grow in the wintertime is not a big deal, okay? So, not to be scandalous, but roses growing out of season, it, would that be enough to conv- to, for you to want to completely change your entire world view and be, be the miracle that's going to uproot your entire belief system? You right. Your entire belief system. Now, see, that's the way the Spanish interpreted it. Okay, but what we're saying in our theory is that actually the fact that Juan Diego actually gathered the, the flowers and brought them down as pre-told in these ancient poems, that that fulfillment was the impetus for them to accept Christianity. And I know we're, we're running out of time here, but if you put the two, as I was saying, if you put the two documents together, they read as two parts of the same story. The first part fills this in, um, fills in the second part. Um, I'm trying to think of other things uh, off the top of my head. Is there anything else, Monique? Will I? No, it's just that whole idea here? that you know, um, people who would have heard that story, and in order to get the numbers of conversions of nine to ten million, you would have had to go um, hundreds of miles in order to gather those kinds of numbers. Because at that time, when the Spaniards got there, only about 1.5 million people lived in that immediate area. And then with all of the diseases and famine and everything else, it got drilled down to maybe about half that number. It's very clear that they didn't see the tilma, something we didn't get into in this in this talk. So they they had a conversion before they began the journey of, of uh, 360 miles, I'm calculating out. They, they use terms in leagues in some of these conversion accounts. So they're traveling 360 miles, 240 miles, 120 miles on foot with their homes on their back to seek out a priest already knowing that they wanted to convert because Juan Diego, who was a Christian, was able to go to Flower World when none of them could. So um, I think that's sort of like right. the, the matter is they understood something very, very deep on a primal level. And there's some other concepts we didn't get to get into, but but they knew something so very there's, like was happening. There's, there's soteriological value uh, um, in the proposition that, that Juan Diego could go to Flower World and they could not, right? I mean, this is what I first heard when you, I'm remembering from a year ago still. Uh, this is, it's kind of the antidote to religious indifferentism and syncretism, right? This is, I mean, this is where I think you guys make a really strong case. This is Mesoamerican um prefigurement of Christianity in a really important, impactful way without dabbling in any of that that ugly uh, Pachamama uh, syncretism. It, it's, it makes it all the more compelling, as far as I'm concerned. Right. It elevates well, the Christian story of salvation over these these primitive understandings of, of salvation, yeah, of soteriology. So I think it's exactly what Tim said. It's like the harpoon. It's the dagger in the back of some of this more, probably more recent tendency to elevate um, and lionize primitive theology. Exactly. Right. Exactly. You know. Uh, you, you know. As, as as many have pointed out, you know, the, the 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 people of Mesoamerica really did have an advanced civilization. They did in certain ways. Um, 
In fact, Miguel Leon Portilla talks a lot about, I was talking about beauty and truth. He really says that the Mesoamerican people at that time were developing existential ideas, uh, philosophy, metaphysics that were happening right on the verge in the you know, right before the conquest occurred. So he really portrays them in this book and, and makes a hard case that these were actually very sophisticated people. These were people who had a belief system in the flower world and were asking questions. And he compares them a lot to the to the Greek. They were civ civilized people. Then how does that square with the fact that they could have been so easily hoodwinked, if, mm -hmm. I, if I may use that term, mm -hmm. by this kind of a simple story and we, we we don't mean to be you know scandalous or anything like that but um, there there had to be something more to it there had to be something that was based in their culture and now and they also knew enough to know that in order to accept the Christian God they had to be baptized so they had been catechized to some extent by the friars that came before so um, there's a lot that we're leaving out right now, but as we we're saying before, it was it was a true Christian conversion through the Virgin Mary, through Guadalupe. They were brought to the truth, and the truth could, is Jesus Christ. Could you give us the the name of the poem again? Quica Pecayo, and the spelling is a bit complicated. That's great, thank you. And would it be your contention um, that this poem is in? It's kind of a uh, a special act of revelation, kind of a more like a veiled act of revelation. Obviously, the fullness of revelation is found in the Catholic faith, and we have the fullness of truth, right? Mm -hmm. So this is not a, a syncretistic question. But, well, as I was saying earlier, you know, we know that when when the human race fell, and not every culture, you know, these cultures took truths and they kind of mixed in error, but not every culture lost the fullness of truth um you know so they have truth mixed in with error so do you think that it's just like a carryover of an original understanding that never died out about the nature of god and salvation or do you think that maybe there was a special act of revelation made somehow in this veiled way not in the pure way that we have through christ who is the incarnate revelation of god of course we're just speculating you know, because that's all we really can do. But right. it does seem as though God gave God gave a partial revelation to tease them enough so that when Christianity did come, they'd know how to respond. It would right. seem making the soil kind of fertile for this to take root for the fullness of truth. Kind of like what happens. Uh, and and again, I, I'm not making a full comparison with the Old Testament, but that the new is is hidden. Um, in the old, and the old is fulfilled in the new, it's almost like that, although I wouldn't put it on the level of augustness with, of course, the Old Testament, which is revealed, inspired truth. Well, you know, we didn't get into this, but um, in the records, when they were trying to evangelize the the natives before Guadalupe appeared in 1531, they, they talk about two concepts. One of them is Nelly, which means root, and also means truth, and the idea of Yankuik, which is new. Now, the belief that the indigenous had was that if something is new, it could not be true. That truth is has to be rooted. And and that was that was a major, major stumbling block why the natives did not. It would be something that 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 we all believe we believe in our in our christian in our catholic faith we we believe that it's rooted in something we don't believe that any kind of new thing can come along and uproot things well some um, of us you know, believe right that. off the bat any of us believe that in catholicism we we right. we are all for do here you know lovers of the old anti-modernists tell that to a lot of the bishops but yeah <laughs> Well, yeah. So you know, it, it, it they had the same beliefs, and that was a major resistance why they didn't convert. Like but it's an Aztec is, is that, hermeneutic of continuity, in a way. Yeah, yeah, in a way, it, it's basically they were they were given a story that was uniquely theirs. They were given a story that was uniquely American, and it has to do with this flower world, and this concept of flower world tie so beautifully it's like a meta narrative with the guadalupe story that actually is fulfilled by the guadalupe story so it had it had to take something that was going to be rooted in their culture 
in order to actually open up a path for them to accept the gospel message. message. That's what we believe. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And I mean, as we're, we're out of time here, I would just say, this is like the, is it the largest single evangelization, the Guadalupe event in the history of Christianity? I mean, the, you, pound, you know, pound for pound. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah Amazing. Yeah. With the Protestant, you know, uh, Reformation, we lost about 9, 10 million within a couple of years. So with the uh, apparition of Guadalupe, that number came in within a very short period of time. So it, in effect, replaced, I hate to use that word, uh. the that have been lost during that same period of time because that happened in 1517 the 95 thesis of martin luther and you know the, that yeah. that kind of comports with how how a traditional understanding of how providence works you know one of the traditions is that obviously a third of the angels fell from heaven right with lucifer and you know some of the ancient thinkers uh the the patristics would venture to say that we are so Salvation history will carry on until the number of um, those who are of the elect of the human race are sufficient to replace the number of angels that fell. Now, that's speculative theology, but we have it when things are rooted so well in tradition, they, they're, they're not to be lightly discarded. Beautiful. We really appreciate your guys' time, and I'm, I'm appreciative for your friendship. I, I think um, we're going to continue to all watch your your. Um, theory develop and hopefully take in the mainstream. I mean, I'm all but convinced. So um, thank you guys so much for being with us here on Rules for Retrogrades. I look forward to your book coming out, and I think everyone out there should as well. Do you have a publisher for that? Not yet. Not Maybe. yet. I'm going to help Maybe. you. I'm going to help you get that. You know, this is an important story that needs to be told, and again, Man, people out there listening, don't neglect the Americas. Don't sleep on the Americas. People, you know, I've gotten a lot of this in, in you know, the, the pivotal role mm -hmm. of North America. Americans are like self-loathing Catholics. They, they think it's all, you know, continental to, to Europe. That's really where Christianity flourished for, you know, 1,500 years. But then it, it began to rot there because of, you know, the arch heretic, uh, Luther and it's really it's really taking over here starting at that exact time exactly. uh, 1500 North and South mm -hmm. America I think you guys are doing great things for uh, uh, Mesoamerican studies and desecularizing and uh, demythologizing the secular histories which have uh, taken apart the connections that's really important stuff anyway thank you guys very much and uh, We'll, we'll, maybe we'll see you again. Maybe we'll do a follow-up show sometime soon. Everyone, happy love to OLG do it. feasting. Thanks for coming on, guys. I appreciate it. Really enjoyed uh, it. Wonderful yeah. talk. God bless. God bless. God bless you.